for us. So Ephesians chapter 2 is where we're at as we're making our way through this book, talking about relationships. And of course, we're dealing with our relationship with God. Somebody once said, there are people so poor in this world that all they have is money. I want you to think about that because it's so true. There's some people that are so poor in this world, all they have is money. Because God has given us so much more, so much more. He's blessed us abundantly, as we talked about last week, these riches that we have in Christ. We looked at these nine gems and the fact that God chose you, God adopted you, God accepted you in Christ. God redeemed you and forgave you and revealed his will to you. You are his inheritance. He sealed you. He's given you his spirit as a guarantee of the future with him. Ephesians chapter 1 was all about the possessions that we gain in God. Ephesians chapter 2 now, he continues on, and it's all about the position that we have with God. You see, your salvation is not just the riches that are given to you, but there's a transformation in you in sense a transferring of you from deadness to life from being an enemy of God to being his friend, to running from God to God now welcoming you as a part of his family to sit next to him in a sense in that place of honor. It's a wonderful thing. And and in some sense, it's the greatest rags to riches story ever told that God would make a way for us to have fellowship with him and a relationship with him. Why is that so important? Because what you have in God spiritually and with God relationally will determine how you approach life practically. And that's why he does. In in Ephesians 1 through 3, he spends time talking about this relationship we have with God and with others before getting into the things that we often want to deal with, mostly dealing with family and dealing with, you know, uh, uh, workplace scenarios and stuff that really hit us hard. God says, let's spend some time sitting at this place of realizing all that God's given you. And then you'll be able to respond rightly to those things. And so here we are in chapter two. And again, I want to give you five really powerful works of God in our salvation as we see here laid out in this chapter. And the first one is that you are a new person. You've been made alive. Look at verse one. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Who was I? Well, I was dead in my trespasses. And trespasses are a willful disobedience. We've all seen the no trespassing signs. The sins are those errors and mistakes and iniquities that I make. But it's important for us to never forget who you were. Never forget where you came from. The dead ends that you were stuck in when God found you. Never forget what you did that killed you. The sin. sin, The wages of sin is death. And we have to remember that. It's still the same even today. An unbeliever, as he says there in verse 1, is not sick morally. They are dead spiritually. They do not need a resuscitation. They need a resurrection. That's what God has done. He made us alive. And I think it's important for us to remember this when dealing with unbelievers, that the spiritually dead do not care about the spiritual things of God. They don't. So don't get bent out of shape when somebody says something that's anti-Christ or somebody comes against, you know, uh, uh, your way, your, your Christian views. Some Christians really get bent out of shape. I can't believe they did that to me. Guess what? They don't know God like you do, and they're going to do that. That's their natural response. Expect an unbeliever to act like an unbeliever, maybe. You ever think about that? And not like a saint. Sometimes we think, well, at least there should be some moral boundaries. Well, welcome to today. It's not happening. But it's for us to realize that us personally, I once was dead from sin. But not only that, verse 2 tells me I was disobedient to God, in which you also, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. I was in bondage to my sin captivated and controlled by it, following wherever the the sin led me and the lusts and stuff would say, oh, this is cool, let's do this. And he says there that we were walked according to the course of this world and literally it's wherever the wind blew, I went. 
Some of you ever had that experience. You've kind of lost at sea, so to speak, and, and the winds, just the course of the world and the lusts or whatever just blew you, blew you into the rocks of pain and into this area of shame and into the sandbars of isolation, and you got scars to prove it. That's what Paul was talking about. I remember winds, even in China, probably some of the fiercest winds I've ever faced, and I literally had to, was walking sideways. It blew me sideways. And you try and it didn't work and then it threw you into ice and you slipped around and fell and you're only trying to get 30 yards. It's crazy stuff. But we've all been in those places and felt those winds spiritually to blow us. And who was behind all of this? It says in verse two, the prince of the power of the air and that's of course Satan because he wants to make people disobedient to God because he wants to destroy your life. If you thought he was just a nice guy like Sparky the sun devil, then he got it wrong. He's not there to do push-ups and root on your team. He's there to destroy your life. He's the prince of the power of the air. So here I am, dead in sin, disobedient from sin, and doomed because of sin, verse 3, among whom we also once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. We're all in this together, that we all have failed. We're under God's wrath. There is a judgment for our sin. And so Paul is painting this very dark picture uh, for us to see the connection and to lead us uh, to uh, verse four. But many of us could easily testify. You could easily testify how sin just wrecked your life. You can go back in the days that you're ashamed of or of the things that you can go back in your mind and remember and you know how sin controlled you and it shamed you and it really wrecked your life. And, and yet, at some point, you came to know Christ and you realized that my story didn't end. It just started going because he made me alive at that point. Yes, God loves to work with messes because he's great at fixing things. And chap uh, chapter two, verse four tells us, but God. And if you have a, a pen, underline that because that's a huge transition. As we see the first three verses, the, the depravity and darkness of us and the deadness, there's also a but God there. But God, and this is who God is. And no matter how bad the sin got and is, maybe even today, you gotta recognize this. Your God is greater than that. He's greater than those things. There needs to be this but God moment in your life, a point where you see him uh, move because you couldn't. You were stuck between that rock and hard place, between sin that is killing me and controlling me, and God works his way in. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love, which he loved us. I remember that but God moment in my own life. Of course, I was a, a youngster at the time. It was February 14th, 1980. Valentine's Day of all days. And I was in Mrs. Hagen's class and going to Calvary Academy is what it was. I remember. I forget a whole lot of other things, but I remember that. And she presented the gospel to us because you could. It was a Christian school. <laughs> and it was at that moment that I realized in my childlike faith, I, I need Jesus. You bet I need Jesus. And the Lord took me at that point. I remember this little Bible she gave me and she wrote in the front, you know, on it and dated it. There's some Valentine's candy in it too. <laughs> Jesus saying, be mine, you know. But do you have that but God moment where God intervenes in such a way and he does it all the time. And it's not just in salvation that we're talking about, but I tell you on a daily basis, a weekly basis, there are times when the Lord says, hey, I want to intervene right here. I want to speak to your heart. Why would God save a sinner like you and I? Well, it tells us in verse four exactly because he is rich in mercy and full of great love. He's not looking at the mess you're in saying, well, I'm not sure about this guy. He's looking at what he can do and he knows the power of the cross. So he loved us when we were at our worst. God's doing his best because God loves to work in hopeless situations. And when you realize your life is hopeless, the depravity of what sin has done to you then it makes all the more great the work of the cross. You realize God did this for me because he loves me. Look at what he did, verse five. He said, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Paul's just kind of exploding. I gotta put this in parentheses here, you know, because I, I'm, loving, I'm loving grace. He made us alive. 
He's shared in our death to bring us to life, and I'm not just on life support. It's not like he just kind of kick-started and went, well, someday I'll get back to you, and you can kind of hang out in ICU for the rest of your life if I get around to you. It's not like he's just saying, well, you know what, you just said over there. No, he brought you into fullness of life. When he means that he made you alive, he, he, he gave you a new name, a new life, and a whole new person. He did what you could and I could never do on our own, make us alive. Instead of separation from him, I made a new creation in him. 2 Corinthians 5.17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. What a great hope for all of us. That when the Lord looks at you, he's not looking at the old life. He's looking at the work of Christ to say, look at the new life. Let's walk in that. So I'm not just made a new person, but I'm also given a new position. Verse 6, he's raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. What a really cool thing. He loved me first, and then he lifted me up. He raised me up. And those of you that are Bible students, you know the story of Lazarus. He was one of the most famous uh, situations where Jesus came and raised somebody up from the dead. And you know the situation surrounding him that he was sick and, and he died. And Jesus came four days later and said, remove the stone and called him out by name. And this guy was raised back to life. But do you ever know what happened to Lazarus after that? Some people don't. In John chapter 11, the Lord raised him up. But in John chapter 12, verse 2, it tells us what Lazarus was doing next. He was sitting at a table in fellowship with the Lord as his sisters were preparing a meal. I, I think there's an example for us. That when God has raised you up, he's raised you up not just to say, hey, go do what you want, have a nice day, and if you need any help, give me a call, text me, email me, I'll, I'll be there. He says, no, I've raised you up because I want you to sit at the table and let's have fellowship together. And that's what he's raised us up. We've been raised up to heaven, to have a seat in heaven, to have fellowship with God himself. And my whole mindset becomes changed. Look at Colossians chapter three. If then you are raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on the things of the earth, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And so we have a whole new viewpoint on how life is. From that salvation high point with Christ, we're looking down at our life and we're no longer thinking it's all about me and all about this and that. We're looking at it going, Lord, how can my life reflect you? How can I, I be a, an example to you here and here? Lord, what are you doing? And, and how can I come alongside of those things to bring glory to your name? It's a complete different outlook. Because Jesus rose again, I have a seat at his table and I have fellowship with him that continues on. So he loved me greatly and made me a new person. He lifted me up to a new position. Look at verses seven through 10. I have a new purpose now and forevermore. He says that in the ages to come, that he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourself that is the gift of God, not of works lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. There's a whole new purpose. People say, what's God's purpose for my life? Well, because of Jesus, it is both fulfilled and found. Fulfilled first one day, as he says there in verse 7, fulfilled in heaven for, for all eternity. And we forget about this, but your life is going to be on display for all eternity. God wants to show you off, but it's not about you. It's not your runway to strut your stuff. It's like a trophy case. You're the trophy to just shine bright of the work of Christ because it's all about him for his glory. But your life is going to display his glory for all eternity. That when you run into friends and when you run into family and even angels that are peering in, listening to your conversations, it's all about Jesus and the grace of God and how good he is. And everybody gives a woo-woo in heaven because God's, you know, on the throne. And it's a great thing to think about. God wants to take your life and reveal how amazing Jesus is in heaven for eternity. But it doesn't stop there because God wants to use your life even here on earth. My purpose is fulfilled in heaven one day, but it's found on earth today. And that's what he gets to in verse 10. For we are his workmanship. The Greek word is poem, where we get our word poem, poema. 
And really, when you think about a poem, it's a, a song, a statement. It has, you know, sometimes a, a rhythmic aspect to it. But it's meant to declare something. And we are God's workmanship, created in Christ, this new thing. He is shaping you through the word and through prayer and even through sufferings that your life would be a testimony to, to people and for all of heaven of the great majesty of God, the great work of God. Maybe you have some things in your life that are kind of handmade. It might be a, a thing from a child that you had that, you know, no one really values it much and it looks, you know, like just scribble on a paper, but to you it, it was handmade and, it, and then it has value. When we were in China, we had these, these things, it's really crazy, but they'll dip their hand in ink, their palm on this side and a fingernail, and they'll do this whole artistic design just from ink with their fingers. And we have them now hanging in our house, in our room, because it's one of those things that we go, wow, that's handmade and that's pretty cool in my eyes. A great workmanship. And that's what God wants to do through your life. This purpose is found, as he says in verse 8 and 9, it's by the grace of God. It's not by you and I being so great, it's God being great. I simply place my faith in his finished work. He says there, again, very clearly, because these are powerful, powerful verses, for by grace you have been saved through faith. That's the vessel which salvation comes. And that, whoops, sorry, that, speaking of your whole salvation experience, is not of yourself, it's the gift of God. Wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. It's not of works, lest anyone should boast there. So God has created for, for you to walk in, in good works. The Bible tells us in Titus 2 to be zealous for good works, Titus 2.14. It's part of the grace working in your life. 1 Corinthians 15.10, Paul says, the grace that was found in me worked abundantly. And, and that's part of what God wants to do. There is two things that happen through your good works. Number one, you're sending out an invitation. You're sending out an invitation to all those around you that men would see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. You're sending out an invitation that says, hey, I want you to see what my God is like by gazing at my life and seeing these things. Listen, earn the right to be heard by your actions that reflect the heart of God. Sometimes Christians are too bitter and bent out of shape that you look at them and go, I don't want what they got. But we should really be the opposite, the most joyful and blessed people because we realize all that God's done for us that we want to then extend the heart of Christ to others that they in turn may come in and see this is the real deal here. We're not making this up. We're not faking it. This is real. But the second thing through your good works that happens is that there is a reflection of who God is, that he's good. Look at his handiwork. We want people to see these things. We want people to note our lives, an invitation for them and a reflection of him. That famous composer, Johann Sebastian Bach, the greatest composer there, and in his songs when he wrote, at the beginning of every manuscript, he put these two letters, J, J, stood for Jesus Java, Jesus help me. And then he composed this wonderful thing that, that has stood the test of time. And at the end of his letters, he would write S, D, G. And they meant solely Deo Gloria, to the glory of God. That when you looked at the handiwork that he did, you would notice Jesus first and the glory of God last. And that's a great thing for us. That God has said, I want to stamp your life with the work of the cross and Jesus first. And at the end of your days, when you have gone to come be with me and in heaven, you're reflecting this very thing. It's all for the glory of God. It's not for me. It's not even for the legacy that's left behind of faith. It's for the glory of God for eternity. Because as some of you know, the legacy of faith, though you would want it to go from generation to generation to generation, it can stop because of somebody who chooses, I ain't going to follow that. But when you say, my life, Lord, to the glory of God for all eternity, that's the, what God does. You realize that God's goal and everything he's doing is always for his glory? I can see it in the good times. Can I see it in the hard times? Lord, you're taking me through this for your glory in my life, and maybe you're chiseling away an area that I need it to be done. Lord, you're blessing me abundantly in this area. It's for the glory of God in your life. 
ultimately, everything the Lord does is to reveal and glory his name. The fourth thing, time-wise here, we'll run through this pretty quick, is found in verse 11. I have a new peace. I've got access to God in oneness with others. Verse 11, therefore remember that you, are, that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, or in other words, made in the flesh by hands, the difference between the Jew and the Gentile was the circumcision, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That's where we were. We were separated. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near, for through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father." You see, in verse 11 and 12, we were separated. There are two classes of Gentiles and Jews. They hated each other. The Jews thought that the Gentiles were only fit for the fires of hell, and the Gentiles thought the Jews were the devil incarnate. You thought your family had problems. And the Jews and the Gentiles would not mix whatsoever. A Jewish man would say, you know what, I, I refuse. I, in fact, the prayer was, Lord, I thank you. That, no, no derogatory terms here in any way, but the prayer was, Lord, I thank you that I'm not a Gentile or a woman. The Jewish man would pray. Wow, that's how sharp it was. And you go, Gee. crazy. But think about how terrible that can be. And you think about the issues even today. In the temple, they had a middle wall that was called the, the wall of separation. From the Jews could go further in than the Gentiles. And that's why Paul says there in verse 14 that he broke down the middle wall. And on that wall in the temple, it said this inscription, no foreigner may enter within the barricade which surrounds the sanctuary and enclosure. Anyone who is caught doing so will have himself to blame for his ensuing death. That's tension in a church right there, man. <laughs> That's not a good situation. That's really not creating a oneness there. But Jesus came in and broke down the wall. He broke down the enmity, broke down the hostility, and instead he places and makes them one. He doesn't just say, guys, the wall's broken down and people still stand off going, eh, I don't think so. That's okay. I'll st I'll, we'll draw a line. <laughs> he says, I broke down the wall because I want you to be together. I want you to be in fellowship. I want to do something special here. I want to do something different, and I want you next to each other for the glory of God. Gentile, Jew, man, woman, rich, poor, come together in Christ because he's a unifier. He's a one maker. He's a peace giver. And I want to encourage you that if there is reconciliation that needs to be made in your own life, First of all, are you at peace with God, the great peacemaker? And secondly, are you a peacemaker with others? Sometimes it's time that we stop and we put the gloves down and we say the bitterness needs to go. I'm coming back because the cross and people are more important than whatever the issue may be. You see, because the Jew could always still look at the Gentile and go, mm, I don't know. And the Gentile could still look at the Jew and go, uh-uh. But in Christ, we say, uh-huh, you bet, because Jesus is worth it all. Don't just say we need to get along and love people. As it's been said before, be the change that you want to see in others. Make Jesus a bigger deal than your issues. And the cross brings us back to our senses to see what we lost, to see where we messed up, to see how things can be fixed in Christ. So the last thing we get to, number five, is a new place. You see, God loved me, number one, and made me a new person. I'm alive. He lifted me up to a new position. I'm in fellowship with him. I'm seated in the heavenly places. 
He launched me forward with a new purpose that is fulfilled and found both in heaven one day and even on earth today. God has things for me to do for him, to bring him glory. And then he lets me rest in this new peace that I have with him and with others because the war is over. And lastly, he leads me home to this new place of heaven. Verse 19. Now therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Boy, I love that. God says, I want to give you a new home. You go from strangers or a, a visitor to a citizen, which is a home, home, having a homeland, being a member of the family. And you know, my dad calls me the other day, hey, you want to come to England? Check your passport. You see, you got to have a passport to go. In my heart, I could say, man, I just so want to go to England or I so want to go to Mexico. Lord, I will so want to be used. I'll just go anywhere for you, Lord. But I don't have a passport. Well, guess what? You're not gone. <laughs> well, get the passport. And then when you go to those places, there's this thing that's stamped in your passport because your passport says you belong where? To that country. And you get stamped on there a visa that tells you you can come into this new land, you can enjoy the sights and sounds, you can, you can experience it all for a certain amount of days, but this ain't home, so you're going to have to go back. But having that access to then say, now I want to be a citizen here. The Lord says, guess what? I've taken care of it. I want you a citizen. You see, sometimes... People can think that, well, you know what? I went to church. I did good things. I, you know, I, I, I experienced those things. Doesn't that count for something? I can tell you this, honestly, according to the Bible, that on that day when you stand before God, he's not going to say, man, I see that you went to church on Christmas and Easter. I see that, man, you attended that event and this event, and boy, that was nice that you gave, and Oh, man, oh, well, come on in. That's not how it works. If I can reiterate what the Bible says, John 14, 6, Jesus answered and said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except by me. Heaven is made for the believer in Jesus Christ as a place of fellowship with his Savior. God will never force anybody to be there. He gives us the choice in the matter. But he says, I so want you, every single one of you that I've made. Change your name. Take on mine, Christian. Come over from deadness to life. Change your address and say, that's my home. And I know where I'm going because I want to be with you. So these five things that we see here, a new person, a new position, a new purpose, a new peace, and a new place.